Hello everybody. We continue our series today through the book of Acts and we are at chapter 13. We meet a, a Roman governor who is searching for faith. He's looking for meaning in life and he's asking those eternal questions. And so you might have turned on to YouTube today, flicked across onto Facebook, and you might yourself be on a search like this Roman governor. And if you are, there will be an opportunity before this broadcast is over for, for you to come face to face with what the Bible says about truth and about life. But by far the majority of people watching today, I'm assuming, hold a deep faith in Jesus Christ. And, and this is a, a very encouraging text. It's a, a text and a teaching today on how we can be sure of our faith and have able to discern the false prophets and false teachers among us. So let's Let's pick up the reading, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be a blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Let's look at this false prophet, also known as, as a sorcerer. He, he was used as an, as an instrument of distraction. And so let's look at those two facets of his distraction. Firstly, sorcery. If you look at a dictionary definition of sorcery, sorcery is the um, magic aided by evil spirits. And you might say, well, Grant, really? Isn't that like wives' tales? 1985, I was in matric in an Afrikaans class, and our teacher wasn't there for some reason, maybe having a smoke break. And one of the students got up and claimed that his parents were spiritualists and did seances, and he had some of the tools of their trade with him there that day. He had this magic key, and he had a magic book, and he had a string that he attached to the key and hung the book like that with the string. And then he said, listen, you can ask this magic book questions. And if the answer is yes, it'll move clockwise. If it is no, it'll move anti-clockwise. So we ask questions like, did Martina Navratilova win Wimbledon? It swung in a certain direction. Was Ronald Reagan president of the United States of America? It swung in another direction. At first, I thought he had just wound up the string and it was winding one way and the other. But then I realized this thing actually is moving under some sort of power. Well, I was a believer back in those days in matric, and I, I wasn't going to get the class totally enthralled by this demonic manifestation. So I didn't cause a scene, but I got up and walked. As I walked to the toilet, I walked past the action, and under my breath, I said, in the name of Jesus, stop it. And I walked on to the bathroom. Well, when I came back, I don't know what happened, but the dude was a laughing stock in the in the, in the classroom, the book was chucked out the window, and, and the game was over. People are desperate for truth, and they search in dangerous areas. Let me give you another six that are very closely linked to, to sorcery and mediums. If you go to a medium, you're going to someone who is contacting the spirits of the dead. Likewise, if you go to a sangoma, He's going to contact the ancestors. The word horoscope is arrived from the Greek words meaning a look at the hours. Now, 
Now, astrology is different to astronomy. Astronomy is a science. It's the study of the stars. So astrology, if, you, if you're lining up the planets and trying to get supernatural understanding of your birth and the trajectory of your life, it's in this arena. Fortune tellers, palm readers, tea leaf, tarot card readers, they all fall under the same using extra sensory, ec extra natural uh, means to, to give you answers about your future. Psychics uh, claim to have uh, other senses, so not just the five senses that all of us have, other senses by which they discern uh, truth. And so if you're exploring uh, truth and meaning through those means, like uh, Elimus was, like the proconsul was, uh, you at the moment are deceived. You are distracted from the truth. In fact, the Bible is very clear about these pursuits. In this particular text, verse 10 says, as Paul looked at Elimus, you're a child of the devil. In other words, making it very clear that that sorcery was demonic. And that is the message on the whole Bible on these matters. In Acts chapter 19, Paul's at Ephesus. Um, some magicians get saved, and what they do is they bring their scrolls and they bring their, their little keys and books like the dude had in my Afrikaans class, and they created a massive bonfire and burnt them. And so, Elimus was described as a sorcerer, and clearly, biblically, you looking down those routes, the Bible would suggest that you didn't. But he was also called a false prophet. Now, uh, Paul, when he's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, says something like this. He says, there will come a time when people will no longer put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around themselves a multitude of teachers to tell them what their itching ears want to hear, and they will be swayed from the truth. Now you ask yourself, how do you gather a multitude of teachers around yourself? Well, back 2,000 years ago, you would have to go to a lecture theater, you would have to go to some symposium when, when all the, the, the philosophers were sitting together. I suppose that was possible. But could it be that God was speaking directly to us? Because for us, at a, at a swipe of a finger, at a click of a button, we can have a multitude of teachers around us. And that was a sign of the times to come, that we could gather a multitude of teachers to teach us and to tickle our fancies what our itching ears want to hear. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the information that Paul was talking about there comes in, in two primary fields, a false gospel. In other words, people who talk about religious matters, maybe even the Bible, but doing it in a way to guide you off track, or just worldly philosophy. So let's look at those in turn. Let's look at a, a false gospel. They are those who are preaching today who will say, for example, the Bible is dated. It is old. It's like, you know, God has developed. He's, he's modernized. So, so for example, the institution of marriage, as it was portrayed 2,000 years ago, archaic. In fact, you can have multiple wives. In fact, you can get married multiple times. In fact, who you get married to, that's also open for debate. Now, we'd have to stick to the, the Bible, your, your ideas on sexuality. God is he's, he's so much more advanced than he was back then. In fact, society's moved on, and, and he's moved with us. And so, you know, what the Bible says about your understanding of sexuality is, is, is absolutely irrelevant. That, that is one very strong school of preaching that you will find if you flick in the right places on the internet. Another uh, false gospel is, is that all roads eventually reach God. So, so you can, you, we can be Christian, but we've got to be nice to everybody else because everybody else is actually going to spend eternity with us anyway. And so... There's a, uh, there's a Hindu heaven and there's a Muslim heaven. It's actually all the same place. Another false gospel that has been preached ever since Jesus is a legalistic gospel. 
In other words, it all depends on you. It all depends on you getting your act into gear, boy. You better sort yourself out because God's not pleased. And so uh, Paul, when he was running to the Galatians, said, like, who's bewitched you? You started off understanding that this was a, a gift of the Holy Spirit, and now you, you're trying to do it by yourself. He says, in fact, he's talking about circumcision, and he put it very graphically. He said, you know that, that operation that you have to be circumcised as a, as, as a male uh, Hebrew? He says, you're forcing Gentiles to be circumcised like we are. He says, I wish you'd mess the whole operation up and, and cause a lot of damage. <laughs> a little, little bit graphic. He was, he was so vexed by the element of truth that was distorting the truth, the gospel. And so you can flick around on the internet and you can find distortions of Christianity and, and you will see it all over. And, and the church looks really ugly when the purity of the gospel is distorted in whichever one of these facets. The other thing that you will find from false teachers is a worldly philosophy that creeps into the church. So a, a, let me take a couple for you right now. Humanism. Humanism, humanism is, is the idea that outside of God, outside of any uh, belief in the, the eternal, we essentially as humans are good people and we'll do good things to, to make our place a better better place for our, our children and, and for everyone in the future. In fact, I think the anthem song for humanism was written by Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie. We are the world. We are the children. There's a choice we're making. We're saving our own lives. It's true. We will make a better day just you and me. What are they saying? We're going to save the world, you and me. Let's link arms with this great humanity. You see, the problem with that worldly philosophy, it, it, it leaves out the fact that we are depraved, we're fallen, and we're in need of a savior. We can't save ourselves. Another philosophy is that of hedonism. Hedonism is the idea that the world is in such a mess that we might as well just suck every bit of joy we can out of it while we're alive. And so Woody Allen, the actor, the philosopher, the cynic, Put it this way, at the end of Crimes and Misdemeanors, he says, all you can hope for is simply to enjoy the pleasure of the day, to hug a child, to take a boat ride, to just enjoy your life. And then, of course, there's the worldly philosophy of existentialism. Now, the existentialism is basically this, that the whole world is such a mess, but I'm going to be noble despite the mess. Jacques Manot, the award-winning biologist, said, you know why we exist? Our number came up like a Monte Carlo card game. In other words, you're saying, like, we've been accidentally created by the universe to be conscious that we're an accident. It's, it's like, it's such a mess. It's just, and, and so, well, we know that that's the situation, so let's just be noble anyway while we're here. And so these worldly philosophies can creep in very subtly and, and muddy and color the truth of the gospel. And so this Roman governor, I don't know what philosophies he was dealing with and I don't know what Elimus was saying to him, but it's clear that the text says that he was being distracted from the gospel. In fact, it even looks like while Paul was preaching, Elimus was saying, no, 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 remember what I told you. Remember what I told you. It's not this. This is not the truth before Paul shut him up. And so you might be like that Roman governor, looking for truth, wondering, sifting, wading through worldly philosophies and strange teachings that come from the Bible. Or uh, you may be a Christian that's saying, listen, I know there's a lot of rubbish out there. How can I be certain of what's true and what's not? Well, hopefully in the next few minutes, we're going to make very clear what Paul teaches is the gospel and then we're going to end by looking at how we can discern what is, what is true and what is false. So now it says in the very last verse, verse 12, that the governor uh, became a believer because he, he believed the truth. He believed the gospel. He was amazed at Paul's teachings. But it doesn't actually say what Paul taught him. 
So we need to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. A couple of years later, Paul was speaking to Titus on the neighboring island. Remember the governor was on Cyprus? The island in the Mediterranean next to Cyprus is an island called Crete. Titus was there. And Paul said to Titus, in Titus chapter 2, he said to Titus, now you must teach the young how to behave, teach the old how to behave, teach the women how to behave, teach the men how to behave, teach the slaves how to behave, teach the owners how to behave, be, because we want to make the gospel attractive. And then he begins to describe the gospel. And verse 11, Titus 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Grace has appeared and offers salvation to all people. The first thing we need to understand is the heart of the gospel. The good, gospel means good news. The heart of the good news of God is that you don't deserve it, yet he comes after you. You know, if you've bought the fact that You've got to get yourself tidied up, cleaned up, behave well before God will accept you. You've missed the grace of God. The grace of God is while you were in your mess, God says, I know you're in a mess. That's why I'm offering you salvation. I was talking to a Muslim man the other day who had claimed to have been converted to Christianity. But while he was talking to me, it was very clear to me that all he had done is traded one religion for another, one set of rules for another. One moral code for another. He had missed an understanding of the essence of what it is to be a Christian, that you don't deserve it, and yet God comes to you. He comes after you to accept you. And this is what it says, to all people. He doesn't want one person to be lost. And then this is the essence of the gospel, to save you. Save you from what? Save you from yourself, because you can't save yourself. Save you from your sin, which is, which is the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The, the consequence of your sinful life is a bad future. Saving you from your sin. Save you from all these ideologies. And, and salvation, in a Christian sense, is not a moral code switch. It's not a changing of mind. It involves a changing of mind. But to be a Christian means you've become spiritually alive. You've become spiritually awake. The Bible says you're now a new creation. When you accept the grace of God and you put your trust in Jesus, His Spirit makes you alive and you are, are regenerated. That's the theological term. You become, a, you become a living spiritual being alive to Christ. You didn't deserve it. You gave up, you surrendered, and God says, okay, I'm going to do this in you. I'm going to transform you from the inside out. I'm going to put my spirit inside of you, make you alive, and then grow with you and develop you and, 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 and go on a journey with you. Verse 12 says, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So not only is it undeserved, not only is it an, an awakening spiritually, but it helps you live afterwards free from the entanglement of your life. It gives you a power to overcome the things that have held you back. Have you ever tried to give up a habit? Maybe you just compulsively angry or obsessively jealous or you're addicted to something, and, and you try and try. The, the, the essence of the gospel is that because God has accepted you and His Spirit is now inside of you, that acceptance that you, are, that you haven't earned your place before God, that you're His, and His Spirit is inside of you, the grace of God teaches you to say no to ungodliness. Does that mean you're suddenly perfect? Well, God looks at you and he says, because of my son, I'm, I'm accepting you as perfect. But you, he, it teaches you. So you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. And, and you're going to repent and turn around. And God's grace is going to hold you and, and lead you in a way more righteous. Verse 13 says, while we wait 
for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the gospel message is expressly uh, the idea, the truth, that you are going to meet God face to face. Now through the ages and possibly for you and for me, we're going to meet him the other side of the grave. There is a reckoning coming. You're going to meet him. But the Bible says that there is a time coming when the world has run its course, when we've exhausted the possibilities of returning to God and to doing what he's asked us to do, that he's going to wrap up history. And at that point, the Bible says he will return. He will take the church to be his. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. That's part of the gospel. The, the message of the gospel is not that you get this insurance ticket to go and sit in heaven. No, no, God has a plan. More glorious. The Bible says of that plan, it's beyond what you can imagine, dream, or comprehend. Verse 14 says, the fifth element that I would like to speak about who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all the wickedness and to purify us for himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The, the beauty of the gospel is that God wipes away our sin. He wipes away our guilt. I've studied uh, philosophy as part of my undergrad degree and, and in fact, even postgrad. And I know that one of the attacks against religion is that it brings guilt. And that is absolutely true. If you are part of a religion that says you've got to behave like this, otherwise you're a naughty boy, and you've got no help to help yourself, you are going to be guilt-ridden. And it's going to manifest in all sorts of psychological and emotional deformity. But, but that's the point. That's religion. The, the gospel says that God takes away your guilt and with it the tyranny of, of sin and the tyranny of guilt. And so it's, it's just a beautiful thing. when It's a relief. It's a relief like the world of your shoulders when you know God said, my son's uh, atonement on the cross is his, his standing in your place. He's taking the punishment for you, the consequence. Of it. It, it means that I'm going to wipe away your sin. And just like the governor, you're able to respond to that good news. And in a couple of minutes, you're going to have that opportunity. But maybe you're sitting there as a believer today and saying, it seems easy to, to drift off with all the stuff that's going on around and all the false teachers that are around. How do I know what's false and what's not? I have a brother-in-law who sells leather to the leather industry. But he's an expert in leather. For years, he's been working with it. And so every time I want to buy a pair of shoes, and I'm not certain if they're genuine leather or not, or I want to buy a lounge suite, I'm not sure if it's genuine leather or not, all I've got to do is phone my brother-in-law. You see, he's, he's so familiar with the genuine article that when he picks a pair of shoes that come from China that look like leather, he can smell it and he'll tell you it's not leather. He can look at it and he can tell you it's not leather. You know, we'd have to send it to a lab. He could do it just like that. Why? Because he's so familiar with, with leather. And, and so it is our greatest protection of being uh, drifting aside is to become familiar with truth. Spend time in the Word. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. And, and as you're familiar with truth and as you're familiar with His Word, so, so you're less likely to be swayed. But what I'd, I'd like to do is, is I would like to, to look at a couple of uh, methods that you can use as you're examining a doctrine and, and, and to help you. The, the first one is to ask yourself, is this thing that someone telling me in the Bible? Is it in the Bible? If someone says there's a Hindu heaven and that Hindu heaven is the same as our heaven, is that in the Bible? Secondly, you need to ask this question. Even if it's in the Bible, does it reflect the main themes of the Bible? Because the Bible talks about all sorts of things. Just because it's recorded in the Bible doesn't mean it's a main theme in the Bible. 
And so you can, you can have people giving a whole sermon. I listened to a sermon the other day for 45 minutes linking the mark of the beast to COVID-19, the COVID-19 vaccine. And I thought to myself, even if this guy is correct, I'm not going to listen to this preach when I finish listening. I'm not, not going to take it in because after 45 minutes, Jesus was not mentioned. The gospel was not mentioned. The accent was on fear and tyranny and, and a scientific explanation. It wasn't on the essence of God's plan. And so even if this guy has found something, I'm not going to take it from that preach because, because it's weighted. There is a word called antichrist in the Bible. There is a verse that talks about a mark, but the main theme of the Bible is the grace of God, the sovereignty of God, the coming of God, the salvation of God, the, God's purpose with His church, not that little side issue. And so it's not that we can't deal with those issues, but it's got to be within the main themes of the Bible. And that would apply to any side theme. And then thirdly, ask this question. Does it glorify God or does it glorify a person or a thing? When you finish listening to a person speak, are you more in love with God, more in awe with God, more enamored with God, or are you more obsessed with that thing? It's a sure sign that it's, you see, heresy starts just with one degree off, but three years down the road, you're a mile off. Fourthly, does it strengthen or weaken the local church? Do you know what God is building? God is building his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, if your theory, if what you're listening to is destructive to local church, then you can say, well, well, it's against what God's building. So it's probably a degree off. There might be some elements of truth in it, but it's a degree off. How did Paul handle this false prophet? I'll tell you how he handled him. It says in verse 9, Then Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus. How do you handle falseness? Well, you, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit because He helps you to discern what's right and what's wrong. He leads you into all truth. He's the one who's not only your comforter, but your guide. It's good to ask questions. You know, when you, when you read the Bible, you should ask questions. In fact, the, God wants you to ask questions. But you ask questions from this vantage point, knowing that God is in charge Jesus is the savior of the world and you understand the gospel. You ask the questions within that. So every question is ultimately answered in the person of Jesus. If you answer questions debating whether Jesus is good or Jesus is God, you're in a lot of trouble. You've got to settle that issue first and then you answer any question you like. Ask any question you like from the vantage point of God on his throne, Jesus is savior over your life. And then my final encouragement would be to you is surround yourself with good, strong believers. You know, you're vulnerable to deception when you isolate yourself from good, wholesome fellowship, a church that preaches the gospel, community of believers that are surrounded. If you're not in a small group, a connect group, find the pastors that you connect to and say, get me into one of those small groups. I want to be tucked in, not uh, separated. And so as we draw things to a close, I wonder if I could ask you in your lounges, behind your computer desk, if, if God has been speaking to you this morning, why don't you stand to your feet? I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. If, if you're worried about um, being distracted, if you're not worried about being distracted, but you've just been filled again with the, the wonder of your salvation and you want to be thankful today, let's, let's pray together. Father, I pray for every believer that's standing right now before you. I pray that your grace would be so clear, so evident. I pray, Father, that you would come upon every person that has taken a step toward you right now, that you would bring comfort and strength and assurance. And Lord, we, we say we are so grateful. In fact, words can't describe our gratitude and our relief that you came after us and you transformed us. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus. But you, this morning, could be like that governor, searching for truth, uh, looking for meaning. And as I was speaking about the gospel, the grace of God coming after you, something resonated inside of you. Or maybe you've, you've made a response to God before, but you've become lukewarm. You've become, you become indifferent to the things of God. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelations? He, he said that they'd become lukewarm. And he said that, you know, we think we're rich. We think we've got it together. But he said, in fact, you are wretched, pitiful, blind, and poor. And, and so if you've become lukewarm and indifferent, there's a blindness, like the blindness that came over Elimus, a blindness that God's wanting to wipe away. And so if that's you today, the grace of God has been extended to you, and He's not wanting one of you to leave this moment unchanged. This is how we do respond. We just say, God, I surrender my life to you. I'm in your hands. And then trust the miracle working God, the one and only true God, to come upon you and in you and transform you and wipe away your sin and restore you to him. If you're ready to do that today, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Lord God, like the Laodiceans, like the governor, I am in need of saving. I'm wretched, blind, and spiritually naked. And I ask you right now to transform me. I ask your, your grace to come upon me, your spirit to come upon me, and make me a new creation. I'm desperate for you, God. I ask you to wash away my sin to, to give me a new start in you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.